Good day. My name is Keith McKinnon, and welcome to another episode of Masonic Curators. It's a cold, damp, rainy day outside today, and we are in Milford, Massachusetts, at the Milford Masonic Apartments. And we're actually working with the skeleton crew here today. Uh, working with me today is another crew member, Chuck Elliott, who came up from Rhode Island to run the, uh, the uh, camera and other equipment and brought some of his uh, wonderful pieces of his personal Masonic collection. And also our guest speaker today is Worshipful Rob Jackson, uh, who will be talking a little bit about the Masonic Lodge and the building. Um, today's episode, we're gonna be talking about <clears throat> this beautiful Masonic membership medal. And with today's episode and a few of the other episodes, our theme today is uh, research and how research can add to the value of a piece uh, and that it's essential at times to do research on the items that you may have. Whether you may be a Masonic collector or a Masonic investor, uh, two different types of people, but if you take the time and do the research on something that you may have, you may have greatly uh, increased the cha-ching value or the historical value like we have done with this piece here. Now, Chuck has the largest uh, Masonic personal collection that I have seen anywhere. And Chuck has a particular eye on picking out certain Masonic pieces. Um, not because of their historical value, but more, I think, because of their art and beauty. And he has that eye, and some of his pieces that he has in his collection are magnificent, such as this. Now, when Chuck was in the process of bidding this on an auction, he contacted me for about a little bit more information about this medal. And we do that here at Masonic Collectors. Uh, we bounce back and forth with each other uh, when we have questions about Masonic pieces to see whether or not the other may have more information uh, about it. And after doing some research and finding two other similar jewels like this, we have concluded that this is a membership jewel from Apollo Commandery Number no. 1 of Chicago, Illinois. And we'll have better photographs that will be accompanying this video and also on our Facebook uh, page when we uh, edit and post this video. Um, the research work on the end really paid off, but the jewel itself and the metal itself is also extremely unusual. Uh, for those who don't know what a membership jewel is, each commandery, such as John and I have talked about before, uh, a commandery designed or adopted their own particular rega uh, regalia or their uniform. And one of the items that they designed was their own membership jewel. <clears throat> and in many cases, a membership jewel or medal differed from the next. Uh, and they were designed in all different types of ways. This is really unusual because you're working with at least uh, three different coatings of metal here. Um, at least one that's silver and the other one that is brass with, I believe, two different coatings of gold, rose gold and yellow gold. Uh, but don't know until they have been tested. Uh, the top bar, uh, is done in, I believe it's a rose gold. Um, and then the bottom metal is actually, it looks black in the picture, but this is all silver. And what they've done is added layers to the metal. Uh, also done in, I believe, a yellow gold and a rose gold as well as some enameling that is also done. Now again, as I mentioned, this is from Apollo Commandery Number no. 1 of Chicago, Illinois, and it is a Knight Templar membership jewel. The other unusual feature about this jewel is that the top bar to the middle is actually connected by a silk ribbon, which you don't see all that often. And it's done in the white and black stripes with gold a little bit uh, along the sides of the black. The other unusual feature is 
luckily for us, or for Chuck, uh, the member had his name engraved at the top bar. Now there is another jewel just like this online that also has the person's name, and I have seen other membership jewels with names on it. But the majority of them do not have names on them, unfortunately. Um, some cases they are done on the top, in some cases they are engraved on the back of the metal. Now, the research part, and this came in two pieces. First, Chuck and I did research on the individual whose name appears at the top of the metal. And that is James Lasky, L-A-S-K-E-Y. Um, now, as I said, this is from Chicago, Illinois, but Stephen had roots back here to Massachusetts. Matter of fact, he was born in Bath, Maine on January the 29th, 1848. But his parents actually lived in Boston. Um, we do know that he married Ab uh, Abigail. Uh, we don't have the date yet. And that we do know that he, at some point in time, him and Abigail moved to Chicago. And we also know that they have uh, or had three sons. Now he is listed in the 1888 book of registered voters uh, in Cook, Illinois, as living in Laughlin Street. Uh, his occupation at the time was a salesman for a dry goods store. Uh, he must have been one hell of a good salesman because he actually had a housekeeper that lived with him and his na her name was Martha. Um, we also come to find out doing further research that he actually submitted <clears throat> uh, a couple of uh, patents to the U.S. Patent Office and two of them were approved. Uh, one in 1883 for bid overalls, another one in 1893 for a hammer which is used in the stitching um, uh, field, uh, used somewhere on a, on a uh, um, sewing machine. Um, he is also listed in 1905 as president of the Lasky Company, which was situated at 185 Dearborn Street in Chicago. Uh, still don't know what the company actually produced. Now, as I said, we know he was a member of Apollo Command Unit Number 1 because that's his membership jewel. Also lucky for us that there are records or historical records of Apollo uh, Command Unit Number 1 online. And we were able to find his name uh, and we were able to copy that paperwork uh, with that information. He was knighted in uh, 1880. So the jewel we do know now comes from 1880. Uh, I believe it was in March of 1880 that he was knighted. Um, membership jewels and diplomas were usually given to a Sir Knight either on the night that they were knighted or the night that they signed the bylaws. So we do know this is 1880. Um, he remained a member of the commandery for his lifetime. <clears throat> um, we also know that he still had connections here in Massachusetts. Uh, while he lived in Chicago because there are a couple of newspaper articles that talk about his wife opening up their summer home here in Boston uh, in the 1920s. He did die here in Boston in July 10th, 1922, and his wife also passed away here in Boston at a later date. Now the unusual thing is he's not buried here in Boston, nor is he buried in Chicago. He's buried in Wisconsin with his wife. And why? Well, because in the research, Chuck and I found out that one of his sons moved to Wisconsin, and he's buried in the Rochester Cemetery in Rochester, Wisconsin, where one of his sons moved. So his son probably had the bodies either moved or buried there when they passed away. Now, we also have photocopies of his membership, and also, we have copies of, uh, photocopies of his um, headstone, uh, which you can also find online by doing research on an individual. But the most interesting factor about doing the research, and this is part two, that in doing further research, Chuck and I found out that he was one of 20 or 25 Sir Knights 
that came from Apollo Commandery No. 1 of Chicago and traveled to Cleveland, Ohio in 1881 to participate in the Masonic Knight Templar funeral procession of President James A. Garfield. Now, James A. Garfield was a Mason, Royal Arch Mason, and a Knight Templar, and uh, was assassinated in 1881, and in his very huge funeral procession, he had a large group of Masons, Royal Arch Masons, and Sir Knights uh, in the procession. Now, I am 85 to 95 percent positive that this medal was at James Garfield's funeral procession. And why? Well, in the rulings of the Grand Encampment of today, if a Sir Knight attends a Sir Knight's funeral, he will be dressed in full Templar uniform. The membership medal is part of a full Templar's uniform. We have a Sir Knight currently who is looking into whether or not that ruling was still in effect in 1881. And we also have another Sir Knight who's looking into uh, some further research for us uh, who attended the 125th reenactment of that funeral procession in 2006. And he stated that at that reenactment, there are photographs that exist of the 1881 Masonic Knight Templar funeral procession. Uh, procession. So we're trying to get a photograph of a certain knight that may be fully dressed to see what he is wearing. So what's some of the missing dots? Well, we would like to have a photograph or an image of uh, Stephen Lasky. Uh, we'd love to know why he moved to Chicago. Uh, we would like to know <clears throat> uh, what Masonic Lodge he belonged to, but this is information that we can probably get later. And above all, we would like to have some photographic image of a Sir Knight that was at the funeral procession uh, of James A. Garfield in 1881 to see what the uniform they were wearing. But again, if he was in full Knight Templar uniform, which he should have been, this medal would have been on his jacket. So there's not a lot that exists out there for Knight Templar memorabilia from that funeral. Uh, we do know that online there is a small white silk ribbon that on the top has a black mourning ribbon applied to it that was given out to either a number of Sir Knights or the entire Sir Knight uh, regiment that was there. Uh, and that is dated 1881 and it does say Sir Knight James A. Garfield. Other than that, there are probably other items in other collections or in Masonic buildings or in museums that we don't know of just yet that may exist. So this is where research came into play that I believe has greatly increased the cha-ching value and above all the historical value of this piece here. So remember, if you have a Masonic jewel, it has a name on it, it's a metal, penny, coin, uh, metal, uh, do the extra homework, do the extra research, and I just want to point out one thing. Uh, this has been what, Chuck, about a month that we've been working on the research on this. Uh, it is far from over. Uh, it could take us another six months. It could take us another year uh, to get all the dots uh, connected. So don't think that research is going to be like an overnight or a weekend type of thing. Spread it out over time if you're doing research and then double check your research to make sure that you have the correct information. So with that, uh, the crew here at Masonic Curators want to thank you very much for watching us. Um, remember, give us the thumbs up. Uh, also, one thing, if you're touching somebody else's memorabilia, as you saw with me, Wear the white gloves, it's not yours, it's somebody else's. Also, white gloves help prevent the oil and dirt from your fingers by when you touch the uh, metal and leaving, or even on the cloth by leaving the oil and dirt on it. So it's just a good idea when you're touching certain things like this to wear white gloves. Um, follow us on Facebook, us on the Curators. Uh, remember to hit the subscribe button. And with that, take care, thanks.